All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name, like always, Josh Corporal. Welcome, my friends, to the porch, Key West, Florida. Today, I have very special guest, Michael Johnson. Michael, welcome to the show, my man. How's it going, guys? Thank you so much for having me. So good to have you here. Uh, we, I can't wait to talk about this subject today. But before we get into all of that, let me explain to everybody listening watch it at home, whether you're listening on the podcast or watching this live, what it is that we do on Fire Builders Live. We take guests, we take these big ideas, and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every single day to improve, because it's that consistency that will make all of the difference for you. And let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. It's all about feeling good, but not just feeling good, feeling good on demand. And that is why we have Michael on the show. Michael Johnson, a professional 10 dance finalist. He has two U.S. swing titles, certified ballroom adjudicator, and was one of the top dance teachers in the United States, training professionals from all over to attain their peak performance and to maximize their dancing skills and capabilities. And over a decade of pursuing this dream of professional dancing, Michael then realized that he was no longer happy. The man needed a change. He decided not only to help himself, <clears throat> but to do so by helping other people as well. And now life coach, master NLP practitioner, peak performance trainer, he is on a journey of internal progression, and he's helping business owners, sales teams, other individuals really pursue consistent and sustainable happiness. And that, my friends, is what we're going to be talking about today, and that is also why I'm so excited to have you on the show. So, Michael, it's a pleasure, my man. I'm honored. Welcome again to Fire Builders Live. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's a that was an epic intro. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Between that and Elvis, I'm sure you can hear the rooster in the background Absolutely. too. He's screaming for you. Uh, hey, when you have so, Elvis screaming for you, you can't go wrong. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. Uh, that's right. Well, so man, this is uh, it's so good to have you here. I I like to start the show. You know, tell everybody um, a little bit about where you are in the world and. What's a typical day like in your life these days? Oh my gosh! Well, uh, I live in Utah currently, and uh, and it's an amazing place. I have to tell you. I mean, like I lived in New York for ten years prior to this, and I've been here I think fourteen years now, and uh, it's amazing. I was just telling you, uh, there's there's more national parks here I think than anywhere else in the United States it, that you can get to quickly. So my family and I decided that every weekend, every Sunday, we were going to drive like two or three hours, maybe four max, go someplace, see it for the day and drive back. No way. And, That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So we started that a couple months ago and we've seen some amazing things. I mean, we went from complete desert, crazy hot to it snowing the next weekend up in the mountains. And, uh, it, it was amazing. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the family life on the backside, but, uh, we're, what's, what's crazy actually is I, I feel like people don't really realize how diverse of a terrain Utah has. Oh yeah. It's amazing. We have so many of the seasons in their entirety. So you can get a, a good amount of snow when it's winter and when it's cold and it doesn't get so cold that it's unbearable. We don't have the humidity here. So it doesn't like eat through your bones on either end of the spectrum. And, uh, and we have deserts all over the place. So we have forests, deserts, super high mountains. We've got lakes. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. We, there, it's a, it's a beautiful place. If you haven't been here, come check it out. Look us up. So much <laughs> different than New York. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. like New York city. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, my God. Totally. Well, okay. So, so what actually, like, what's a typical day? Like, is it, is the stuff that you're doing, is that what brought you to Utah? No, actually, uh, when I was dancing on the, uh, on the circuit, that's when we were in New York. We, it was the best place to be. I mean, artists, dancers, uh, of all kinds, singers, musicians, New York is really the place to make that happen. And it's, it's the hub, but, uh, but moving on from that, we decided to have children and uh, my wife's family moved here while we were away because we had come to school here uh, while we were in college. And 
So it was really kind of a, a natural place to head back to because her family was here and she wanted the support of her family as we raised our kids. And so we ended up here and I actually never thought I'd end up in Utah, but, uh, but that's what, what happened. And so we just made it work and it just seemed to be the right place to be. But, you know, on a regular basis, it's, we started off by building our dance business again because we had built it up in New York. So we came back here, started building that up again. Uh, we ended up opening a brick and mortar ballroom school, which I still have. Nice. And uh, have my team run and, and they take care of things. So that's awesome. And they're amazing. And uh, Do you find the same passion about dance in Utah as you did in New York? Well, it's a little different. You know, it's a, a different crowd. The There's more adults uh, dancing outside of uh, Utah. And in Utah, it's more about competitors. And so there's a lot more kids from the ages of six to college age that are all, you know, gunning for competition. And so we really were able to open a competitive studio here instead of opening a adult studio, which we had been part of in New York. So it, uh, it was a different, it was a different, uh, side of things for us on the ballroom end, but you know, it was fun. It was, it was good while it lasted. And, and it's sort of during that time I realized, Hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't all I can do. This isn't the direction I can go. And so I started heading back to, cause I had, I had a personal development business, which was our magic for life company before that, even when I was in New York, I was uh, doing that next to our ballroom, but I had shut it down when I moved to to uh, Utah because back in the time there Zoom wasn't a thing like we didn't have Zoom there was no like I had a whole set of clients while I was in New York that I did personal development and life coaching with but when I moved to Utah it was like well see ya you know and Wait, were you doing it it was face to face it was face to face yeah. yeah life coaching was we were face to face that was the thing like you want to do it over the phone no, that's too weird. Like we don't do it over the phone. You have to get in, in person. And so when I moved, I, I dropped all my clients and uh, it was like starting again. And I thought I had to do that. And little by little technology sort of came back on the scene and, uh, and is built up. And, and we all know we've been through this tech boom over the last 10, 15 years where things have just absolutely changed head over heels. And I actually, unlike some people, I'm super thankful for the pandemic because I mean, you look at it and you go, wow, thank goodness that people started to get used to using Zoom. Thank goodness people got comfortable with it because many of us were comfortable with it prior to the pandemic, but it was like pulling teeth to get people to get involved in the tech and all of the cool things that we can do from our phone, from our computers. And because everybody was sort of forced in the house, I think society as a whole has sort of gotten better at technology and we've had this huge up, uh, uprise in education in that regard. So now if I say, hey, let's get on a call, most people don't think that I mean on the phone. And most of them realize no. that, oh, I'm, we're going to get face to face. We're going to talk. And that wasn't a thing a year and a half ago. You know, if I said, hey, let's get on a call, they'd go, what's your phone number? And <laughs> nowadays I don't give out my phone number anymore it, it, for anybody. It just would be weird to me yeah. and to most of the people that I work with. So it's yeah. a big change now, you know? Yeah, no, seriously. It like, it pushed everybody to the starting line all at the same time. And, yeah. and what was an interesting thing, cause you're right. Like the transition to getting more comfortable with technology, using zoom, more video chat kind of thing would have been much slower without the pandemic oh, yeah. and without the force. But also what's interesting is that if you look at different countries and they're, they're, even slower adoption of technology for things like e-commerce, uh, they were all pushed to the same starting line. So for them, the you know the advancement was so much greater. It was it's incredible to watch. It's amazing, and that kind of changed. You know, to get back to your original question of of what my day usually looks like, that changed what my day looked like a lot. Uh, I was able to start getting on uh, more life coaching calls. I could get on face to face and talk with people and be engaged with them. Uh, and, and it wasn't weird for people anymore. And it was a lot more typical, which made it easier to actually be helpful. And so, uh, 
you know, I got on more calls. I was able to do more Zoom meetings and more uh, engagement. And so it really changed the nature of how our, my day looked. You know, I could get up, do some sales calls, do some uh, connection calls, collaborate with partners and, and other entrepreneurs much easier, much quicker to see if we had something in common that we could do. Uh, and, and I could still do, you know, like I said, I have my brick and mortar business and, and I feel like it's my, I call it my candy. You know, it's, it's the place where I can play and have fun. I get to work with a few pros still here and there just because I like it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's living the dream right there. And so, you know, I get to build, build magic for life in the mornings. Maybe I'll teach a, a lesson or two in the, in the evenings if it works out. And, uh, do you still keep up with it? Are you still as like regimented with the dance? Well, you know, I don't, I don't do it for myself anymore. I mean, mostly it's just what I have in here yeah. that, uh, that my competitive professionals that work with me still want. And so I still do a little bit of that, but I mean, they have to be pretty high end to get in on my schedule. Like I don't, I won't just take, I used to teach younger kids all the way up the ranks and nowadays it just you know i have other pros and other teachers that would do that and so really i can be picky and choosy and that's why i call it my candy i can get in i can choreograph i can i can share high end information with those top end competitors and it's a lot of fun but literally i don't i, I do that so little in my day anymore that it's it's yeah. literally just fun and candy for me to play around with and it's it's cool to have a a you know brick and mortar location that i can do it in and and they still have their competitive space and they can do that. So it's fun, but, uh, but I end up spending my time running summits and doing challenges and, and uh, creating uh, content and education for people on their emotional operating systems and how they can upgrade themselves. And that, that's really where I've sort of uh, stuck my flag in the sand and, and started to move forward on that side of things. Well, I love, so the reason that I, I'm glad that we started this conversation with dance is because it provides some context into what makes you such a good coach for this particular thing, for the mindset stuff. Because, because there's a lot, let's just be honest, there's a lot of people that are out there doing the same thing, like trying to help other people make, make themselves feel better, right? right? But what separates you from everybody else is the fact that the dance part, right? And and I've never done, so I've never been a professional dancer. I've never been in a competition, right? But I can imagine that it, it, it requires a ridiculous amount of discipline mentally, right? And that's the kind of stuff that you bring to the table when you work with people, I would imagine. Yeah, well, there's a huge amount of discipline and you, you said mentally, I'm going to take it a step further. It's a huge amount of discipline emotionally because there's so much going on. And if, you, if you've ever played any type of sport, if you were in athletics, whether it was high school athletics or all the way up to the professional ranks, the big challenge for athletes is not to get too emotional one side or the other. So you'll oftentimes hear coaches say, Hey, not too high on the highs, not too low on the lows. You could be up by 20 points, but I don't want you like crazy celebrating because you could just as easily lose the, that 20 point lead in a basketball game. And we see it all the time now, now it's not a thing anymore. And uh, to lose a 20 point lead and, and lose the game. And a lot of athletics has preached that. And, and I understand why, right? Not too high on the highs, not too low on the lows. Let's just kind of stay even kill. We've got a game to play and we're going to keep in that same mindset. But for dancing, we had to take a little bit of that from athletics because dancing is incredibly athletic. Uh, and to, to do what ballroom dancers do, uh, most people wouldn't understand or believe how athletic it actually is. It's, it's is it cardiovascular? Yes. Or and physical, like, and muscular, like you, there's so much in it. You have to uh, have a really high level of agility, a really high level of uh, cardiovascular ability, and you have to be able to maintain it over a long period of time over and over again. So you have lots of little sprints, each dance you compete at, at a minute 30, and then you have maybe 
10 or 15 seconds in between the next dance. That's a minute 30. Then after you do five in a row, then you break for a half hour and then you got to do it again if you make the next round. And that might go on for a day, you know, at the biggest comps, it, it, you know, if you go to like Blackpool in England, that's one of the biggest comps in the world. And you basically, you have to perform as sharp on the last dance as you did the first one, probably Absolutely. even more even so. More. Yeah. 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 And so you have this high level of physicality that has to be done, maintained, consistent, but you also have to have this incredible ability emotionally to sustain that performance because there's two sides of the emotion when you're a dancer there's your own emotions and what's going on inside and there's the performance emotion of what the character in the story and what you're trying to portray and if you're fake people will read right through you they'll read right through you so so really the holy grail for dancers and especially ballroom dancers is authenticity within that space of emotional output. And all of a sudden, you know, along the way, I had created these really amazing processes based off of some of my experience with NLP and, and having been trained and, and uh, certified in that. And we had created these process for these dancers. And, and this was, gosh, I mean, it's been 15, 20 years since I've started doing it. And I started to realize that, hey, gosh, we don't have to just do this with dancers. So I started pulling in people that were non-dancers and going, hey, let's do this. Let's try this in your regular everyday life. And we started to see these ridiculous results on how we could upgrade people's emotional operating systems so that they could not only be able to portray what was going on inside, but actually manage it a little bit better because people started to realize they weren't taught that when they were in school. We didn't learn it in kindergarten or high school or college or basically anywhere. We learned it by watching. And unfortunately, when you watch and you learn from observation, you can gain some pretty bad habits from your parents, from your friends, from your teachers. And those bad habits combined together create one natural, nasty, big, bad habit because nobody taught you how to do it properly. It's actually not that hard. It's not painful. It is a lot of fun. It isn't, uh, it isn't as daunting as people might think. And when you start to learn how to do it, all of a sudden you look at, at life and you go, well, gosh, why have I been acting that way? I thought I had to do that. And it isn't true. You know, we can all be response able. And that's an interesting idea, right? Being able to respond. We are response able. And usually when you say to somebody, are you responsible? The weight of the world comes down on the shoulders and they just feel like, oh, how am I going to deal with that? Yeah. But when you, when you split it and you go back to the way that maybe the word was intended was to be response able. We're supposed to look at things in our world. We're supposed to look at what's going on around us and we're supposed to observe it. And then we're supposed to be response able. We're supposed to be able to respond to what's happening. And that response should be managed in here and with our emotional navigating system, which tells us whether it aligns with us or not. And that is, oh my gosh, that might be too deep. So if you guys get the, re, you know, go back and listen to that again, because that was heavy, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. Like, like yeah. the way that, I mean, just on the surface, looking at it in a sense that, that, Again, just to kind of link it to something that people have seen as far as like a dance partner, right? I feel like a lot of this comes from the fact that when you're dancing with somebody, it's kind of the same idea, right? Like you, first of all, it's really cool that you said about the story. Like I never even thought about that. Like that's a thing I would imagine is yeah. that you're portraying a character when you're dancing. It's not like yeah. you're just dancing to dance. Yeah. Uh, but as you're doing that, you're working together with somebody and that's a great analogy to working together with either yourself uh, or with dealing with other people at work, right? Where, where there's a push and a pull, like there's two people that could potentially act independently and sovereign from one another, but shouldn't, they need to act together. And that response, like that call response idea, uh, right. It's basically the physical manifestation of kind of like what you just talked about. Well, there's so many metaphors. I mean, I know every athlete is going to uh, say, well, you know, dance is like golf. Dance is like 
basketball. Dance is like football or sorry, life is like football. Life is like, you know, but I'm saying life is like dance because for us in ballroom, you know, it is always about that that two person. You don't do ballroom by yourself. It takes two to tango. That is a real thing. And uh, <laughs> and there's no three person dancing, is there? No. That's not, there's never, that's never been a thing. Like, like no. not, not unless you're in like jazz or ballet or modern or something along those lines. And then they do trios and, and things like that, but it's still not the same. There is nothing in the world like ballroom. There really isn't because just like you said, there's a relationship that goes on. You have to learn about how to interact with each other, how to be critical of each other without being an ass. Yeah. Um, you know, like you have to learn how to improve and grow together. And it is literally, if you've ever had a business partner, uh, it's literally just like navigating that space. It's, it's a challenge. And usually that is a massive part of the coaching and training for competitive high level competitive ballroom dancers. It's about learning how to manage your partnership. Yeah. It's huge. And it's the same in business. It is absolutely 100% the same. There's a certain level of connection that is uh, ridiculously hard in ballroom and connection is one of the, the high end end game kind of thing that you work on in, in competitive dancing. Once you've been partners for a while and as you go, you're trying to get the best level connection because the better you can communicate, to your partner, to yourself, the better off you're going to do. And I always say, and one of my definitions for dance, and I think it applies to life as we go, is that a good dancer is someone who can command their body with their mind and it listens. Right. What? <laughs> yeah, like it actually listens. And I think in regular everyday life as entrepreneurs, as moms, as dads, as you know, siblings, whatever it is, it's when you can command you to do something and you listen. And I say you and you, because I mean, honestly, we've got our conscious mind and our subconscious. And when those two things are in line, that's usually when we're in the zone. That's usually when time starts to stand still. That's usually when we are in our bliss. But when your conscious mind and your subconscious are in pull or they're offset, you're not in alignment. When that happens, man, it is rough. That's when we don't feel good. That's when we feel bad. And when we feel bad, we literally want Oreos and Netflix and that's it. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, okay. In your experience then, if you have that alignment, is it a situation, which one do you change or do you try to change both? Like do you try <laughs> to change your conscious or your subconscious thoughts? Do you try to bring them together to meet in the middle? How does, how does it work for you? For uh, what I've experienced, of course, everybody's as unique as their thumbprint. There's, there's no doubt. I mean, you are as absolutely unique as your thumbprint, your experience, your education, your knowledge through your life is going to determine how you operate the best. And so I can't say it's one way or the other, but I can say that by understanding how both sides work, you can actually use the right tool for the right job. And I see so many people operating their emotions on a regular basis, uh, sort of like using a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. They're taking the piece that maybe isn't the right tool for the job. And they're like trying to bang in the nail and going, it's not working. I don't understand why. And I'm like, well, okay, you're using your conscious mind really. And you need your soul in this particular sense, or you're using your soul and really you need some logic and you need some conscience, it, but it just depends on the person. It depends where they're at and what they're doing. I mean, uh, you know, I used to for many years work with, um, work with some people on depression. They'd come to me and the first thing I'd say, and, I, and I'm treading on thin ice here. So I, you know, I understand that, but, and so I'm sorry if I pissed some of you off, but, um, but that somebody with depression would come, they'd hire me to work with them and, and to work through things. And the first thing that I will typically say is, okay, tell me about it. Let me hear what you're doing. I, I try to get an idea. And then the first thing I usually say is, okay, so can you teach me how you do that? And they look at me like, wait, what? I said, can you teach me how you do that? And they say, do what? And I say, how you do depression. And they're, oh, man, that confuses so many people. And they're like, what do you mean? I say, well, you're really good at it. You told me you've been doing that. You've been depressed for a year, two years. And now you're coming to me to get some help to fix it. The first thing I want to know is how you do it. 
And so then we dig in and we go, how do you do that? Because if I can understand how you do it, okay, it's like binary. Hey, you're a coding guy. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Binary is either on or is off. And we work a lot like that as humans. We could, if we know how to turn it on, we also know how to turn it off. We also know if we know how to turn it off, we know how to turn it on. And what I don't want to do is get rid of depression. Depression is useful. It's useful for something. What your something is, I don't know. But what I do know is that if we can learn how to turn it on on purpose, we can also learn how to turn it off on purpose. And that kind of, uh, well, that, that pushes some people's buttons sometimes. So that's okay. I, don't, I can take it. I can take the heat. <laughs> well, no, no, like it's, I think it's fascinating what you just said. I've really, I've never heard it put that way. I've never heard the question, can you teach me how to do that? Right. Because I think it's, I think that's a genius question because it forces the person to, to identify what it is that they're feeling and why, right. In order to try and explain it to somebody else. And the act of doing that brings like forces you kind of to articulate things that you just felt before, but now you actually have to put a label to it. That's right. And once you do that, then you, that serves as a starting point to say, well, why, you know, why am I doing that? I really, maybe I don't necessarily need to do that, or maybe I can think about it another way. It's hard to do that with just a feeling, but once right. you have tangible idea of why, it helps. Yeah. I think it's great, man. I think that's a really good idea. Well, and it works with all emotional states. Now, don't get academic on me here for a second. Just just hang with me. Just like layman. No for, guarantees. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, oftentimes because of academics, and I appreciate them so much, but because of academics, what happens is everybody has to have this perfect scientific explanation of things. And what that's done is it's actually in some ways hurt the regular folk right? If I say I'm doing happy, that's weird language. I'm doing happy. That means I'm doing it on purpose. Most people say I'm feeling happy. And I understand that that is maybe a better way to say it, but maybe the better way to say it is I'm doing happy. I'm doing sad and I'm doing angry. And when you start to say it that way, there's a certain personal response ability that has to actually show up. And now you start to go, well, if I'm doing angry, then what can I do to not do angry? Or what can I do to turn that off? Or how can I manage it? And there are, there are simple skill sets. And of course, I've identified them. I'm a process guy. I love process. I love to be able to say, okay, if I can't do this and repeat it over and over again, then it's probably not consistent and I shouldn't teach it. That's my thought. And so I've looked at these emotional states. And of course, because I had a playground with dancers that are willing to be emotional, it was easy. I could go through and map them all. I could go through and learn exactly how to do it and listen to them and telling me and describing to me and over literally thousands of students going, oh yeah, this is how I do happy. And you go, oh, there's a trend. Imagine yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, this is how I do angry. Why would I do angry and dance? Oh my gosh. You know, when you can see a dance that's portrayed in true anger, there is something powerful about it because you can connect to it. You can see them. And if you've ever seen like a tango where they're literally incredibly angry, but they have to be able to manage it. Now, that's a whole other level of managing your emotions where you actually can manage what's really going on inside, understand how to portray something authentically outside through the story and be able to manage both without getting so caught into one or the other that you forget who you are. Now that's, that's emotional mastery and dancers have to do that all the time. So I had a huge playground to be able to do this. And now it's like, well, gosh, if all I have to do is teach you how to be happy, psh, let's go do that. That's easy. <laughs> if all I have to do is teach you how to manage anger or sadness or depression. Oh, psh, that's easy. That's only one level deep in this inception. <laughs> that's I, first of all, I can see why you're a top coach with this, like, and judge, be uh, particularly with the dancing, because where where I would see, if I were a judge, where I would see somebody simply dancing, right, and trying to like, I don't know, hit the hit the cues and make sure that everything is sharp and everything, 
what you see or what I just kind of realized that you see is like three levels deep of right. managing emotion. Right. And I think that's incredibly fascinating, man. Uh, well, it's, it's cool, right? You get like, you get the logistics of it and you go, okay, well, we've got to judge the mechanics. We've got to judge the emotional content, the story, how they relate to each other, ballroom specifically, you know, it's not required, but it, it was built upon an idea of a man and woman relationship. That's the story it's telling. And so, you know, when you're watching, you're looking and seeing, are, are they telling that story? And anyway, that's a conversation for another time, but <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I like what you said about the idea that I'm, you know, instead of feeling happy, like I'm doing happy because you're right. Like when you say feeling, it almost relieves you of the responsibility to manage right. it. It's like you're susceptible to this feeling of anger or this feeling of happiness as opposed to actively right. conjuring it up within yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we have to be able to take that control back. And I think for our human race as a whole to evolve to that next level, you know, everybody's looking for that next tech that's going to really change everything. And I'm saying the next tech that's going to change everything is when we look inside, when we actually as a whole, not just a few of the people that are really good at it, but as a whole and our society starts to realize that, hey, we can be happy and we can control that from the inside out. And when we can do that and start teaching it to our children, man, we're going to live in a completely different world. And in, in 10, 15 years, if we could train and teach our children, because we've got a handle on it, how to start to operate from the inside out, well, this world would look really different in a really short amount of time, which which I think is cool because the tech, right? We can get to so many more people now. You know, we're we're doing Zoom calls of people in Africa that don't have the means to do it, but there are people that are going there going, hey, let's teach a class to these people because we have the ability to bring the tech with us. So it, it's it's huge. I mean, it's a really big deal. And if we can do that, that is the next advancement in mankind because we can start to look within instead of be without. The uh, the guest that I had on, well, we talked a, a couple of days ago, but the uh, it was very much along those same lines about appreciating the things that you have, right? Yes. Instead of focusing on the things that you don't have. And the, this guy, this guest, Scott Colby, Right. He was down in Guatemala and he saw that firsthand yeah. and he had, you know, he had to leave the United States in order to get that experience <laughs> and then come back and you start to realize like, holy crap, we have desensitized ourselves to everything that we've got here. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and also as you were talking about this, you know, what kept, what, what I kept thinking about was, was the idea so many people like to throw the word around triggered, right? Like, oh man, so that triggered me. And now I just can't stop but be, but help but be angry about it or, or whatever. Again, I think that there is a time and a place for that. But the way that it's kind of used in the mainstream gives you that sense that you're powerless over it. Oh, right. It triggered me. Like, so I have no, no other recourse but to like flip this table. Right. You know? Or whatever. Well, and in all fairness, uh, media it behooves them. It is in their uh, genetic makeup. And if we're talking about the media as a whole, because if they can't control you, then they can't control their advertising budget. <laughs> you know, if they can't get you to watch something when they command you to watch it, well, then they lose money. And so their their genetic makeup is built upon that. And that's a problem uh, I think that journalists are having today is that initially that's not how they were built and made up. But now they're built and made up in a way to use those triggers. And the only way those triggers will work is if the people as a whole do not learn how to be response able, meaning they can choose to observe something and give it the meaning that they want to give it, not the meaning that somebody else told them to give it. And that poses a whole other issue if you go back and study Plato and Aristotle, Socrates from the beginning of time, because they were talking about this stuff ages ago, ages ago. How do we determine? How do we make that up? But I mean, that's a heavy conversation, right? Uh, <laughs> but if you start to dig into, into that uh, age of philosophy, there is a really interesting place because you're talking about that conscious mind, you're talking about the subconscious, you're talking about what's going on outside of you. And you're saying, well, gosh, 
if I can take control and not let what's outside of me trigger me or be in control of me, now I'm in control of me. Well, now how do I learn what's correct and what's not correct? How do I learn what to do? Well, initially we were based upon, you know, it's very primal. Oh, look, that Jaguar ate Uncle Bob. So every time I see a Jaguar. Nobody liked Uncle Bob, actually. Like, well, yeah, I mean, he was dumb enough to get eaten by a Jaguar. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, if, if that happened now, my whole tribe is worried about Jaguars. And understandably so. But the next tribe moved to a different part of the country, but they built in that fear for Jaguars. And now centuries down the line, everybody's afraid of Jaguars. Well, no, they're not just afraid of Jaguars. They're afraid of cats. That tribe, that group are afraid of cats. It doesn't matter what kind of cat. It could be a little pet kitten. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's afraid. You know, but we built that stuff in. And so over time, we do that. And I think that's why the next real evolution for humans is really starting to understand how to manage and upgrade our emotional operating system to a place where we can start to evaluate from the inside out what is the meaning of what we see. And, uh, and that's a big deal. And that's not to say that we don't use our emotions or don't be sad ever again. That's ridiculous. Sad is a useful emotion, useful for certain things. But there are times when sad is not appropriate. And you get to decide that, not me. I don't get to decide. I don't get to tell you when sad is not appropriate. You have to decide that. But how could you even consider deciding it if you didn't have the ability to turn it on and turn it off? So we got to start with that. We got to start with being able to turn your phone on and off. Otherwise you can't use it, right? It's just how it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so if you, if you do go down that road, yeah, you learn how to turn it on and off and then you start to decide for yourself when is appropriate to be sad, for instance, in this case, right. and when is not right. I feel like there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of uncertainty of what is right and what's wrong because essentially nowadays we have so much input from different sources right. and a lot of it is conflicting and hypocritical right. like for every time that somebody says that this is appropriate there's some other person that says that it's not right so the point is what do you think is the way to determine for yourself what's right or what's wrong is it just a gut feeling or is it in context to some other external factors? Well, I think we have to address that gut feeling statement. And because right and wrong is really, really hard. When you start discussing right and wrong, I mean, you just nailed it. The, the, it's a, such a paradox in itself, but it is also such a necessity uh, that we understand it. You see, every time you know exactly what you don't want, you're actually, in a way, defining exactly what you do want. And that's messed up, right? That's really, that really does a number on your uh, psyche. So you got to be able to dig in and, and say, okay, well, if I'm going to figure out what's right and wrong, well, then I have to be very connected to me. We know there are some innate natural law of man. And that is, we know that if you kill something, there's something Oh, it's not right inside. So we know that that natural law, and there's a lot of, of information about this. You could study this till you're blue in the face. Uh, but we know that killing is generally bad. Generally, right? I mean, unless somebody's going to kill you. And then, so now you go, but then we start to put in these caveats. Well, so rather than get stuck too much in the idea that of right and wrong, we we want to kind of live in a space where we talk about getting connected to yourself so that you can actually understand what your navigational operating, your navigational system, right? Which is your emotions, what it's telling you. Because I think some people say, well, I want to trust my gut, but then they go, I don't trust my gut. Last time I trusted my gut, I went the totally wrong direction. And my, usually my response to that is really you're here today. And they look at me like, wait, what? And I said, well, you said last time you trusted your gut, it didn't work out. And I said, but you're here today. And do you like where you're at today? And sometimes it's a yes. And sometimes it's a no, but then I ask, well, what did you learn from that? And so we go back to this idea of hindsight is 2020. Okay, good. So now I can see clearly from behind and you go, well, yeah, I trusted my gut and I shouldn't have done that. And I said, well, great. So your gut led you exactly where it needed to go. Oh, that's confusing, right? Cause it kind of goes in a little loop, but because of hindsight, 
you actually can look back and say, well, yeah, my gut told me that, but your gut told you that so that you could learn that lesson so that you could end up here right now, today. So the, the end of that line and the end of that unfortunate loop that we just created is that you have to actually get really connected to you. You've got to work on getting that alignment that we talked about, conscious, subconscious. And in order to do that, there are lots of ways to go about that. I'm going to say this and I might turn off some of the people in the audience, but I'll just say, hold on tight. That's not the, there's not just one way. Meditation is amazing. Okay. And it doesn't have to be just one way. You, I, th I think meditation in some instances in mainstream has gotten sort of a bad rap. You don't have to become a monk and go to the Himalayas. In fact, you never had to be a monk. If you were great, I'm not dogging it. Okay. And if you want to go do that, great. I'm not dogging it. Those are ways to do it. But you know what? I'm a dancer. There was a form of meditation that happens when you get in that zone that is unlike anything you've ever experienced. Okay. So it doesn't have to be sitting under a waterfall, holding your hands like this, you know, like you don't have to do that. Although I have done that and it is amazing. Okay. So there are lots of different ways to meditate. Ask the violinist when they get in and they're gone, you could see they are not in this world. They're in the, in a total place of meditation. So there are lots of ways to meditate. There are lots of reasons to meditate. Ask yourself, have you tried meditation? Have you tried the multiple reasons there are to meditate? Have you have you gone in and out of them? Have you tried different things? Yeah, well, that's the thing. There's lots of ways to do it. So I'm going to use meditation and that idea as a, a concept. My daughter right now is fascinated with it. She's searching for other ways to meditate because she's like, Dad, I don't really dig the whole closing my eyes and just trying to quiet my mind. She goes, Is that, isn't there other ways? And I'm like, find it. Go find it. You can do it. And so she's fascinated with it, trying to figure it out. She's 16, you know, but hey, She's in a different plane, right? But that's the idea. That's that's the concept. Do you feel like the best way to find out for yourself, like which, talking about meditation, which form of meditation is the right way for you is to simply not put any box or boundaries around it, but just try whatever you feel like trying. Give yeah. it a good shot and, you know, and be conscientious enough to, yeah. to decide for yourself whether or not you like it or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think being willing to try it and understand what there are, what different ways of meditating and what purposes there are, right? I, I talk about three particularly. One is gratitude. Gratitude is sort of an interesting uh, thing because it's kind of in its own class. It's in its own category. Category. And so when you're meditating from the perspective of gratitude, man, you can you can do some pretty amazing things, and it is so powerful. And and we know that from the beginning of time. This isn't this isn't rocket science, but it yet most people on the planet aren't doing it. So it, I guess it is rocket science because they've been talking about it since mankind existed. Then the other two are you're either receiving or you're broadcasting. And sometimes people get the get it mixed up or they're trying to do both. Hey, be a, be a receiver, be a radio or be a broadcaster, right? And one side or the other, and you can do some amazing things. So between those three things, uh, which, and we teach a lot about that in, in all of our stuff for magic for life. But, uh, so if you want to find out more, we, we, we can take you there, but that's the general idea, right? And so meditation is so cool. Meditation is, uh, and, and I've done it in so many different ways, obviously with dance and I was in athletics and, uh, you know, obviously in dealing with business uh, people, it, it makes a, a lots of different ways to use it. So it, it's huge. It's a big deal. Well, I'm glad you brought up like your materials, the kind of stuff that you teaching the magic for life and the stuff that you've got going on now. That's what I want to ask you about, because this has been like we have just scratched the surface. Oh, yeah. A lot of this stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. It's been a really interesting conversation, particularly about the philosophy, because because yeah, it's it's so good to think about this stuff in a world where you're you're excused from thinking about things right. anymore. Like you yeah. just go on to Facebook and just yeah. like you said, people tell you how to think about stuff. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so taking that responsibility back, I think, is fantastic. And I'm curious. Right. So if people have questions, if they. Um, if they want to learn a little bit more about what it is that you do, the things that you have mentioned today, uh, where do they find you? What do you have going on? 
Well, right now, I think the best way is uh, is to get involved in our challenge that we have coming up. I mean, that is literally the best way because, uh, you know, challenges are awesome right now. There's a lot of people doing some amazing challenges. And the reason they're so great is because they put you into a situation where you actually have to take action along with the education and so they're super powerful and so we decided to put together a challenge it's a 21 day challenge we call it the feel good challenge and uh and it's straight up i mean you understand it right away you feel good yeah i want to feel good okay do you feel bad anytime during your week if you do this is the challenge for you do you feel bad anytime during your day if you do this is a challenge for you okay if you feel good most of the time but you're going i think there's another level for me in life, then this is the challenge for you. See, learning the skill set to feel good on demand, on purpose, and from the inside out, this is really where it's at, right? Because if we can do it on demand, gosh, that, that changes a lot. If we can do it on purpose, oh, now that really changes a lot. Now, if we can do it from the inside out, now we're not depending just on the external stuff because there isn't anything wrong with Netflix and Oreos. We're all, we're all using that stuff. But when you use a catalyst solely from the outside, that's when we get into trouble. We've got to learn to use some catalysts from the inside so that we can balance that out. And once we can get balanced, now we can live in this dance of life, which is amazing. So this challenge will do that. It's 21 days. It's a paid challenge. Guys, you got to put some skin in the game. Come on now. You got to put some skin or you're not going to do it, right? Who, who's going to go through and do 21 days if they didn't put anything down? Well, you know what? It's not that. It's not that expensive. It's very, very minimal investment. And so when you go to do that challenge, What's going to happen is you put some skin in the game and now, now you're going to go complete that 21 days. In that 21 days, we're going to get you some habits that will actually last beyond the 21 days. We're going to teach you some skill sets so that you can create new habits if you want to and you're going to be able to continue to build on it. So that's a pretty bold claim for 21 days, but I know in 21 days we can get you the habits and skill sets that you need to feel good on purpose, on demand, and from the inside out. Well, I'll tell you that, I mean, just hearing you talk about it is like get me amped up for it, <laughs> right? And uh, let me throw something up. Like uh, my good buddy, Roz, Roz is watching and he's like, boom, powerful, the dance of life. Dance of life. Yes. I love it, Roz. Yeah, seriously. Like, uh, and Roz is seriously one of the most uh, power, uh, like positive people that I know. And, <laughs> and yeah, and it, and it really is that way. Like, like if anything, you know, you, you've got to put some skin in the game. You've got to pay attention. Right. Yeah. But as far as, is it a situation where, um, people are all doing this together or are they pretty much on their own just with you? Oh, it's, uh, you, okay. So you get signed up, you get registered, no problem. And then this particular challenge I'm doing live. So you'll get me, uh, you'll get me through the whole challenge live awesome. every day um, and uh, we'll get you some action steps. We'll always be doing stuff, something, working on something to be able to create habit. The goal really is to create a few habits. So in the first week, we're going to go through the framework and we're going to go through some habit building steps. And then in the second week, we're going to go through understanding how we can put that into our journey, our life of our journey of how we're going to do this after the challenge. In the last week, we're going to be searching for the magic, the magic in life, right? That's why we are called magic for life. So we're going to be searching for the magic because it is magic. When you start feeling good on a regular basis, on purpose and on demand, now all of a sudden the magic is something you can search for. It is there. It's part of your world. And when you're creating magic in your life, oh, it's great. And that's all from when you feel good. We know when we feel good, life is good. When we feel good, things are amazing. When we feel good, Oh my goodness. You can do anything. You can take on the world and you know it. And when you feel bad, you want to crawl in a hole and die. And we all know that feeling. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to minimize the times when you feel like you want to crawl in a hole and we want to maximize the times when you can feel good on purpose. And good doesn't mean you have to be like Disneyland happy all the time. Right, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, which is an important <laughs> distinction to make, right? Yeah, it's not like, yeah because because that level of happiness, like euphoria, you know, is probably unsustainable in the long term. But raising the bar up, right, to not feeling like you want to crawl in a hole all the time. And actually, I feel like all you got to do is get that first like couple of weeks and then the momentum kicks in and then things just start happening. Things just start happening. Positive things start happening. That's right. Yep got to create momentum and that momentum is 
huge, right? And once we can create that momentum, if we can add habits and skill sets to the momentum, now we can keep it perpetuating. Uh, it's, it's when you don't create those habits and when you don't understand how you're doing it, that it's really hard to repeat. Yep. Agreed. Totally agree. Dude, Michael, this has been so good. Let me put up this thing. Roz is saying, yeah, you know, people need this now more than ever. Agreed, right? Feel good on demand, especially yeah. coming, coming back out of this whole pandemic and the lockdown cool. and no, I mean, people just need a way to deal with a lot of the emotions. Yeah. And that's specifically why we chose to do it right now. We looked around at the climate and we said, you know what? People need this skill set. They need this skill set. We are equipped to teach it. We have been doing it and working on it for ages. We need to be able to bring this to as many people as we possibly can. People have to get out of this funk that they're in from being locked in their houses and being told that they can't connect and they can't do things the way they used to do them. And now it's not going to go back. People go, when is it going to go back to normal? No, this is normal. This is normal. Now we have to change us. Now we have to work on us because this may be the normal forever. And so it's up to us now. And in fact, like there's, you know, there's something to be said about things. If they were to return to the way that they were exactly carbon copied, right? You might end up falling back into the same bad habits that you know you so had true. before, yeah. right? So, so this true. is so this is a way yeah. for you to kind of like just like everybody got, everybody got pushed to the starting line at the very beginning, right? This is a way to push you to the starting line, right? Go through something like this together and really start a new chapter of your life. Yeah, it's, so it's a big deal. That 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 I love how you said that. A new chapter in your life. It's not that there was anything wrong with the last one, but you don't have to live mediocre going forward. You don't have to live blah. Life doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's really where a lot of people are. They've just conceded to this idea that, well, maybe it just isn't going to get any better. And the, the, the truth of the matter is it is. And there is so much more for you. Love it, man. Dude, this has been so good to have you on the show. So I just have to say uh, – on behalf of myself and Elvis the Rooster, yeah, like, this is just a, it's been such an honor to have you here, Michael. So, uh, so seriously, man, thanks again for being on the show and hanging with us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me and and uh, letting me chat with you and and your friends. I appreciate it a lot. Absolutely. All right. Well, I tell you, um, for those that are listening, watching live, and then listening on the podcast, right. So there is a link in the description that will take you right to the challenge that Michael has just described. So go check that out. And, uh, and again, we stream live twice a week now, Wednesdays and Fridays. I realize today's Thursday, but we're in transition. It's totally cool. Uh, and, and so join us for another episode, a future episode. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, go to firebuilderslive.com. And that's it, Michael. You've been a great guest, dude. It is always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank Thanks you again. A pleasure. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. All right, guys. Adios.